Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, National Geographic Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Gorowski. I will be your host for today. If you've been following along, it's been a pretty uh, exciting February. We've been featuring women uh, who are involved in science, exploration, adventure, and conservation. And we've met some pretty incredible people so far. We've got a few more hangouts to round out the month. And I'm very, very excited uh, to introduce San or Shannon uh, Switzer Swanson today. She's a water woman, photojournalist, and social ecologist from San Diego in California. Her research blends the fields of anthropology, psychology, and marine ecology to address some of the most pressing marine conservation issues. She's usually working in coastal communities in Southeast Asia and Oceania and looking for ways to help them manage their resources, still have a good life, and also a healthy environment. And she's currently preparing for a year of field work uh, living in Eastern Indonesia with a nomadic uh, fisherman. So Shannon, it's so great to have you joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much, Joe. I'm super excited to be with everybody and share more about my work um, and hear your interesting questions that you might all have. Um, yeah, super, super grateful to be here today. Excellent. Well, like I've mentioned, we have some great classrooms joining us from different places uh, in Canada and the US. And I just want to give a quick shout out to the classrooms who are going to be joining us on YouTube today. You can still get involved. There's a YouTube chat sidebar. Let us know where you're watching from and send in a question or two. And we'll definitely try to work those in. Uh, but for now, Shannon, you've got the good stuff. So I'm going to let you take over for a bit. Okay, great. I'm going to pull up my little slideshow here. Oh, that's my email. <laughs> Oh. All right. Okay. Can everybody see that? Um, I think we'll have think to try so. again. The share screen didn't go. Oh, it didn't go through? Okay. Yeah, I just have to hit Sorry. the green share screen and then the entire screen option. Sorry about that. We practice this, everyone. That's okay. <laughs> Sometimes technology doesn't always cooperate the first time. Yeah, that's, that is tr very true. Okay, where did my, okay. But it's pretty amazing that we can do any of this. Okay, mm -hmm. there we go. I think this should work. That's a good sign, I see me in your screen. <laughs> okay, perfect. All right, there? All right, there? we're full screen. Okay, awesome. Um, well, as Joe already mentioned in his, in his great um, introduction, my name is Shannon Switzer Swanson, and um, I'm a marine social ecologist, which is a little bit of a mouthful, um, kind of a lot of big, big words put together, but it basically just means that I'm um, using methods and theory from uh, very different fields that aren't traditionally combined, like biology and ecology with um, psychology and cultural anthropology to really try to understand how, um, how it is that people interact with and use um, marine resources like fit, um, fisheries, um, the coastline, um, to understand how we can um, protect it and, and make sure that these people, including myself who loves to surf in the ocean, um, can continue to do so for a long time. Um, and so this illustration <laughs> uh, is actually from a Young Explorer grant that I first got with National Geographic. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about it in a minute. Um, so this photo for me represents two firsts. Uh, it's uh, where I first started uh, to surf and first started to learn how to surf. And also where I first started taking um, photographs and really getting into photography. So. Um, this is off the coast of Santa Barbara, and I and that's where I went to um, my undergrad um, at UC San, UC Santa Barbara, um, and I studied biological sciences um, and really enjoyed my time there. But what I really most enjoyed um, was being in the water and getting in the ocean um, and starting to share uh, that time in the ocean with other people through through photography and taking images of waves and people surfing. Um, and I should say, I grew up in San Diego. So I always had a long uh, connection with the ocean. So, so um, San Diego's in Southern California. I think um, there's a school with us from Anaheim, so not too far away. Um, and so I always loved the water. I loved sailing. I would go sailing with my dad to Catalina Island. Um, I would go free diving. I would go snorkeling. Um, but I didn't start surfing until college. 
um, when I was about 19. Uh, so this is a this is a picture of me surfing. I'm not the best surfer, but I, but I really love it. Um, and one reason I really love it is that I um, whenever I'm out there, I get to encounter wildlife and marine life. So I've seen um, everything from gray whales migrating really close by to um, otters and dolphins and sea lions, um, turtles, and even um, white tip and black tip reef sharks, but just little ones. So they were not going to bother me. But, um, but I just, that's really truly what brings me back to the ocean and to surfing um, is just getting to spend time in the water with all these amazing um, creatures. But what happened was after I started surfing for a while, I noticed that several of my friends um, were getting sick from surfing. So I actually had two friends that almost um, died from really severe bacterial infections that they got while they were in the water, um, and they were surfing after a big storm event. Um, so after a big rain came through um, and washed a lot of the pollutant from land into the water, um, this was in San Diego, they actually got really sick. Um, and I thought that this seemed wrong and this seemed, this seemed strange. So I wanted to understand better why that was happening. I wanted to understand why the pollutants from land and what kind of pollutants from land were, were running into the ocean. So that um, set me off on my first uh, project with National Geographic um, as a young explorer grantee. And I set out to just learn more about my own, uh, my own home in San Diego. And I trekked through our watersheds. Uh, this is actually our second longest river, the San Diego River. And I trekked from start to finish on it. So from the headwaters where all the snow melt ha happens um, all the way down to the river mouth where the river meets the ocean. Um, and I documented the pollutants along the way that I encountered. So here, this is Cedar Creek Falls. It looks beautiful and pristine. It, it looks like you could, you should be able to drink it even. Um, but it's actually already polluted um, with um, fertilizer and pesticides from agriculture and then also from livestock, from manure, and all the runoff from livestock. So it's actually already um, rendered undrinkable. Um, so I learned a lot through this grant and it got me um, really interested. So I, I forgot to mention that after um, undergraduate um, and I finished my college degree, I was set off and worked as a photojournalist for um, several years, for about seven years. Um, and it brought me to many different places around the world. Um, and this project helped me to reconnect with my own backyard, with where I was from, and understand the dynamics between people and nature there better. And so I really love this project. And um, it made me uh, really interested in learning different about different ways that humans connect with the natural world. Um, and during my, my travels as a photojournalist, I would often encounter um, sm what we call small scale fishermen. So they're fishermen that primarily um, catch fish uh, to survive, to eat, and then also to sell um, but to mostly local markets, so not not really as much on the international scale. And so I would encounter a lot during my travels. And um, after I did the Young Explorer project, I decided I wanted to go back to school and I wanted to um, start to to um, gain an expertise and and understand better um, these questions I had about how how people can interact with nature in a healthy and um, positive way. And so. Um, I set out to do my master's. I did my master's degree uh, working with fishermen in the Philippines. Um, and I learned that there's over a billion people across the globe that depend on fish as their primary income um, and also for protein, just um, as their primary, as a primary source of nutrition. Um, and <laughs> when you guys might be itching to get out of school, I don't know, but I had been out of school for about years and I was so excited to go back to school and um, I enjoyed doing my master's program so much that I decided to continue with that work PhD at Stanford University which is where I am now um, and so as I started into my PhD program I um, applied for another grant from National Geographic um, and it was around this time that the um, blockbuster hit Finding Dory uh, was coming into theaters. And so I can't see you all right now because I have my screen up, but I'm guessing that a lot of you have heard of Finding Nemo and Finding Dory, um, those cute little clownfish and blue tang. Um, 
And so uh, myself and a team of other past Young Explorer grantees, we met at National Geographic in Washington, DC, and we started brainstorming about um, a really interesting project that combined a lot of our skills. So, you know, I was used to working with fishermen on the ground and understanding their um, the their strategies for fishing. We had another teammate, um, <coughs> excuse me, Michaela Wujek, who has studied global supply chains. So understanding where different things that we use in our day-to-day -day lives come from across the world. Um, we have another teammate, Andrea Reed, who is a fish biologist. So she was really, you know, keen on understanding the fish themselves and their behavior. And then we had Caleb Cruz, who himself was an aquarium hobby hobbyist as, he, as a kid. So he grew up in Landlock, Colorado, not a lot of, you know, ocean nearby. Um, but he actually fell in the ocean through um, a, a small aquarium tank that he had growing up in, in his living room. And he dedicated his life to marine biology after that, from that connection he made with that, that aquarium. So we met, we said, we're going we're gonna to really figure out where are these blue tang coming from? Where is Dory coming from? Um, and to end up in someone's living room. So that's what we set out to do. We knew from reading different things that um, almost 90% of the fish came from the Philippines and Indonesia, which is in part of the world known as the what um, conservationists call the coral triangle. So it's a really, um, it's an area really rich in coral species and fish species um, and the, some of the richest marine biodiversity in the world. So it made sense that, that most of the fish are coming from the Philippines and Indonesia and this region. Um, and we set out to, to film and to document um, the trip, the, the journey that the fish take. So we went to Bali, which, I've, which you see here I've circled, thinking it'd be really easy to find the fish. We'd, we'd you know, document them. It'd be a pretty quick project. Um, but we found that once we got there, there actually were no blue tang left around Bali. The water, the waters around Bali had been overfished um, and that species was no longer there. And so fishermen really weren't catching them there on a regular basis. So through talking to different fishermen and other um, nonprofits that worked with um, fishermen in the area, we made our way out to central Sulawesi. So it's way out here. Um, and we had a little, a little more luck out in this part of the country. Um, <clears throat> Indonesia has over 17,000 islands, so it's a massive country. Um, so I had this, this, <laughs> this image is a, is a fish trader, is a, or known as a middleman, and his name is Sarli, and I met him when I went out to central Sulawesi to, to find where these blue tang were. So I met him um, uh, on, a, on a whim, basically. And I happened to ask him if he knew, uh, you know, where there might be blue tang around. And he said, oh, I, I get blue tang from my fishermen. That's what I do. I sell, I get them from the fishermen and I sell them um, to Bali. And so he was nice enough to take me with him um, out on his boat to go um, meet the different fishermen in the area. This is where I slept um, on the boat for a couple of weeks. Um, it actually was pretty comfortable. <laughs> um, this is another view uh, from my my five star hotel, um, and so Sarli took me on this on his boat, and we went to these many different islands around the Banda Sea in central Sulawesi, where these fishermen collect aquarium fish, um, in addition to other fish that they eat and also sell. Um, so these fishermen that I were, was meeting were part of the indigenous group um, that Joe mentioned the Sama Bajau, they're traditionally nomadic. So they, can you imagine, I, it would be an incredible life. They traditionally only lived in boats um, with their small nuclear family. So they would live with boats, of, boats to um, five or six boats uh, and travel around together in their small family units. And um, they never would go to shore except to trade their, their ocean products. Um, but then, over the past few decades, they've sort of been forced to settle down into more permanent residences, more permanent homes, like you see here um, in these stilt houses, but they maintain a really strong connection to the ocean. They live over the ocean. They, um, everything they do is still involved, involves the sea. Um, and it's just a, the, it's a beautiful area out there, um, as you can see by that image. Um, this is 
Rostin, and he is one of the fishermen that Sarley collects the blue tang from. And Rostin is one of his prize fishermen because he he's really good at figuring out where the blue tang are, um, how to collect them and keep them alive. Because for the aquarium trade, you want the fish alive and you want them to stay healthy. Um, and this is his family that he um, that he supports and and helps um, provide food for and helps send to school by catching these aquarium fish. Um, so the thing though with aquarium fish and the aquarium fish trade is that um, traditionally over the, since about 1980s, fishermen found a, a very clever way of collecting the fish that made it a lot easier to get a high, a large number of um, blue tang or clownfish or whatever they were, they were after using a poison called cyanide and cyanide is deadly. It can kill humans. Um, it, it, it's a very strong poison. Um, but what the fishermen would do is they would put, uh, they would dilute a few, uh, you know, a small amount of cyanide in a squirt bottle. They would bring it underwater with them and they'd squirt the, the area where they could, um, to target the aquarium fish. Um, and what it does is it would stun the fish. Um, they could scoop up, you know, uh, like a hundred fish instead of just catching a couple at a time. Um, and go on their way. But of course it's a poison and so it um, often is a high high death rate when you use it. So it can kill up to 80% of the fish that are that are stunned by it, don't recover. Um, and it also, it's not good for the coral. You know, coral are living animals as well. And so it would kill the coral. Um, and it's not very good for, you know, human health either. So, as you see here, uh, Rostin has a net that he's using. And so there's been a big push by local NGOs um, to train aquarium fishermen in a more sustainable method of harvesting with using these barrier nets. But it takes a lot more skill to do um, to use these nets. Um, and it's a lot uh, less efficient. So certain fishermen have chosen to adopt this new, more sustainable method, um, while others still use cyanide. Um, there's another destructive practice where fishermen use dynamite um, to fish for food fish. And you can imagine blowing up a big part of the reef is pretty um, unsustainable too. So I look for my research at both of those types of destructive fishing practices. But right now, I want to take you through a whirlwind tour of the rest of the supply chain of the global aquarium fish trade. So Rostin catches his aquarium fish. Um, this is a, an image of you know blue tang that's just been caught as you can see this fisherman is a different fisherman but he has homemade fins on a lot of the equipment that they use they have to repair for many many years because they can't just go buy new equipment um, they're so so quite remote from um, being able, you know from stores and things um, and the work they do is very dangerous that hookah line that Rostin is on um, this we call this a hookah line it's attached to an air compressor and that's how he's breathing um, and I actually tried to use a, I tried to jump on um, a compressor with, with these guys when I was trying to film them and photograph them. Um, and the compressor broke while we were down at about 50 feet below the, the water. So we weren't too deep, but it was quite scary. I, you know, I suddenly couldn't really breathe very well, had to come up pretty quickly. Um, and so these guys, you know, they it's a really dangerous, um, hard job on their bodies. And um, it's just very physically tough. Um, so these fishermen are really tough uh, people. Um, so, okay, so they they collect their fish. These This is a blue tang that's in a net um, pen beneath the fisherman's home back in their village. So if you remember that picture of the stilt homes, this is literally the fisherman lifted up their floorboard in their kitchen. And this these fish are swimming beneath their home, which is pretty cool. So they keep them under their home until the the trader comes to buy them from them. And they just have animals all around all the time. So this is Sarley is collecting the fish. He's calculating what he's going to pay the fishermen. Um, then he he ships them on these local ferries, and they generally travel in these styrofoam boxes. They're in little um, plastic bags like these, um, and they have their oxygen. They're supposed to be oxygenated, and you know they have clean water. Um, the better the the traders take care of the fish, the, you know, the, the more survive and the more money they make. So there is some incentive for sure to try to take good care of these fish as they're traveling. But as you can imagine, it still would be quite uh, shocking as a fish to, 
be taken from a reef and suddenly be in these little bags traveling across the world. Um, so hundreds of millions of fish go through the trade every year. And this, the, the middleman will then ship to a bigger exporter in these kind of like boxes. Um, the, this is a big export facility in Bali. Um, this is Conrad Chen. So he actually uh, is, you know, the owner of this export facility. He, he is really making um, big efforts to make the trade more sustainable to make sure that you know he's using the best possible practices. Um, he's trying to work actually more directly with individual fishermen to know, so that there's a, he knows sort of what they're doing, what practices they're using to catch the fish. Um, the more people you put in between along the supply chain, the more middlemen, the more confusing it can be as to figuring out you know, where the fish came from and how they were caught. So there is a movement in the, in the trade to try to make that more transparent. Um, and then Conrad will send them to the airport, the international airport in Denpasar. And these fish will fly all the way from um, Denpasar out to LA, to Michigan, to different parts of um, the US, as well as Europe and Japan. And then increasingly, um, Hong Kong and China, as their middle class is growing, um, they are also becoming a big um, a buyer of aquarium fish as well. So these fish go on, it's, some, it's about a 14,000 mile journey in all to get to the aquarium hobbyists who have them in their living rooms. Um, this is a screenshot from our uh, interactive website that, we're, that we've been building for the last <laughs> two years. Um, it's almost ready to go live. So I definitely wanna sh you know, share those links with you guys um, at the end here. And um, basically the website will take you from, as you'll take the journey of the fish from these reefs in Indonesia and the Philippines, all the way through to, um, this is a, a fish uh, aquarium hobbyist in Colorado, Springs in Colorado. So um, we met him and got to see the, his tank that he has there um, in snowy Colorado. Um, and we're also building, uh, we're also in the process of making a mini documentary about um, Dory's journeys. So also excited to have that come out soon and share that with you all. Um, and as uh, Joe mentioned, I'm gonna be going back to the field for about a year to live with these fishermen um, in uh, central Sulawesi and to continue to understand how, um, why some fishermen use destructive practices while others don't. and. Um, see what we can learn about making the fisheries in the region more sustainable so they can depend on them for many generations to come. Um, and this, uh, I still do photography and I still do writing and journalism, but I don't depend on it as my <laughs> primary income. Um, so I've really enjoyed being able to do research and then also um, do photography and, sh and be able to share my research through images um, and words to a, a bigger audience like yourselves. Um, and that's all I have. And I'm really excited to answer your questions. That's my Instagram, in case you wanna follow there, um, Future Adventures, it's just my name, um, at Shannon Switzer Swanson. So thanks everybody. I'm gonna stop sharing now. All right, Shannon, that was great. Thank you so much for a few things. Thank you for um, taking us on that little bit of a journey to show us your work and your work in the field and uh, tracing the path of where those aquarium fish do come from because oftentimes you just see them in the tank and you don't actually realize there's a whole kind of global supply chain that's, that's keeping these things going. And then also you looked way cooler on a surfboard than I did when I was trying to learn in Australia. So good stuff. <laughs> Um, all right, well, let's meet some of our classrooms. Uh, we've got a great group joining us today. First, I'll give a quick shout out. I know Mrs. Beckett's class from Paris, Ontario is watching us uh, online today. So please send us in a question or two. But for now, let's meet one of our live camera classrooms. Great. So let's go to uh, Mrs. DeShane's group. They're in Mountain View uh, Elementary, so in Bristol. Um, and I think that's Connecticut, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. Let me turn your microphone on. Yes, Bristol, Connecticut. And we have Charlotte here with a question for you. How long have you been surfing? <laughs> Hi, Charlotte. Oh, thank you for the question. I, so I, I didn't actually start surfing until I was 19. So I am now 34. Um, 
So that's a quite a long time. But you know what? I always wish that I had started surfing younger. Um, so if you know, I would encourage any of you if you ever have a chance. I know it can be hard to get get out to somewhere that it's possible, but if you do have the chance, definitely give it a try. It's so much fun. All right. Well, we should be able to visit each classroom at least twice today. So okay. we're going to come back to Bristol very shortly. You got it. Um, let's see. Let us go to Anchorage, Alaska this time. Mrs. Carton, I believe she's got a group of grade five students with her this morning, and they're in nice and early to visit us. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, Anchorage? <laughs> And all sorts of, we really enjoy your presentation. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Thanks. I'm glad. Hi. Um, I have Hi. a question about the coral reefs. Um, they looked kind of dirty in one of the pictures. Were they actually really dirty? And Yeah. Oh. Go ahead. Sorry. No, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a really, really good question. So um, in the area where I am in the Bonda Sea and where I do that work and where you saw the images from, um, it, the health of the coral is really variable. So it changes a lot. So some of the coral has more um, algae on it and has been um, kind of handled more and broken more, um, while other places are a lot more pristine. But generally where the fishermen were fishing, where you saw that picture, the reefs are a little more broken because they go there pretty frequently. Um, and so that's a big concern, right? Because they want to, the fish need healthy coral, you know, to, to breed and to grow and to live. And um, if the, if it's not, uh, if the fishermen aren't able to help keep it healthy, then they lose their source of um, being able to fish. So it's a, it's a big issue that we really need to work, keep working on together. Thank you. Yeah, great question. All right, awesome question. We'll come back soon. Uh, let us go to Anaheim, California this time. We've got a nice group of students with Mrs. Lee's class. Let me turn their microphone on. Looks like grade sixes. And your microphone should be on. How are we doing, grade sixes? Yeah. 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 Wow. <laughs> it kind of matches a lot of things. <laughs> All right, don't be shy. Go ahead. <laughs> this is a question for Shannon. Shannon, have you ever swam with a shark? You guys are now. Yes, great, great question. Um, I have. I, I, well, I'm an avid diver, and so in Australia, when I've been diving there, I swam with a bull shark, which was that was the biggest shark I've ever swam with. It was pretty scary. Um, but they were, I mean, he didn't, he just was interested in me and checked me out and I checked him out and we were good. Um, and then I've seen tiger sharks, I've seen the tiger sharks. Um, you know, I don't mind seeing sharks when I'm diving where I'm more nervous if I see a shark fin is when I'm surfing just cause I can't re get a read on them as well. Um, and I can't, you know, see them and know what they're up to. So mostly I really enjoy seeing sharks and I've never had a bad encounter with them. Would, would you guys like to see sharks sometime? No! <laughs> Never! Never, okay. That's fair. <laughs> that was like a mixture. I heard some yeses. I heard a very loud no. But yeah. uh, I think they've got a bad rap, guys. You've got to give them a chance. They're not everything you hear on TV, especially Shark Week. It's not yeah, the that's for sure. <laughs> All right. So stealing a question from uh, YouTube. Uh, Mrs. Beckett's group in Paris, Ontario. They're wondering, taking too many of the aquarium fish, like the blue tangs, how does that affect the larger mammals or turtles or shark species? Oh, that's a really, that's a great question. Um, so the, as far as I know, um, the sharks in the area, so the blue, the blue tang specifically, and that the family that they're in, the um, surgeon fish family, they have really poisonous spines that come out when the when other species attack them. So, as far as I know, they actually don't have um, a lot of natural predators. Um, but what they do, and what helps you know them be a part of this uh, ecosystem and and helps keep it healthy, is they um, keep their uh, voracious herbivores. So they munch on all the algae and keep the um, coral clean from algae. 
Um, and they, that allows the entire system to function and be healthy for sharks, for turtles, for every other species that exists there. So that they are a really critical part of that ecosystem. And if they're overfished, it's, you know, it's definitely um, can throw things out of balance. Really, really good question. All right. Thank you for setting that online. We are going to go to Virginia this time. We're going to go to Jonesville, where we have a group of grade six classes uh, all joining us together. Uh, Mrs. Gully, Mrs. Crumley, Gibson, and Jones. Uh, let me turn their microphone on. I bet you they'll be really loud too. Let's see. How's it going, grade sixes? <laughs> So with you being diving and stuff and surfing, why did you do it and what made you do it in the beginning? Thank you. What was your name? Shirley Washburn. Julie? Shirley. 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 Sorry. Thank you for the question, Shirley. Um, yeah, you know, that's a good question. Um, I, I, as I mentioned, I grew up in San Diego, so that's really is close to the ocean. Um, and I had someone in my family, my dad, who already loved going to the ocean. Um, and so it was something I did with him. I would go out there with him and just spend time in nature and um, just really, really enjoyed that and really enjoyed being in, in a different environment, you know, an environment so different from what we walk around in every day, but getting to be um, suspended in water and seeing um, incredible creatures and interesting animals. Um, I just always loved being in the ocean. And um, so that just, per, you know, kind of self-perpetuated. Self I sought out opportunities where I could be by the ocean where I could either do research there or photograph there and that that love just kept evolving and um, yeah and it's just become a passion ever since and so I would say you know any while especially you guys while you're still um, you know have so much uh, life ahead of you, you this is like the best time to explore all your um, you know all your potential um, ways to interact with the environment and different hobbies and different things that um, can get you outdoors and you know, it doesn't have to be the ocean, but whatever's in your own backyard um, to start interacting with and exploring. It's the time to do it. <laughs> Thank you uh, for the question. All right, solid advice. <laughs> uh, our final live screen classroom is Mrs. Cop's group, and they're joining us in Anaheim as well, uh, grade four classroom. Let me turn their mic on. And I've heard grade fours can be pretty loud too, but let's see. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Oh. Let's try again, grade fours. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> how long? How long does the effects on the poison last? And does the poison affect fish that they're not trying to catch? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah. The, so the poison itself lasts in the environment for for years but the thing is that the poison it dilutes it spreads out and becomes so thin that it's hard to, to actually perceive in the ocean anymore after about um, an hour or two it really disperses um, but it doesn't mean it's not still affecting you know the the environment um, and Yes, the, one of the big problems with cyanide which you picked up on is that it targets fish that the fishermen don't actually want to catch and so it, it actually is really um, detrimental because they leave a lot of fish behind that have been poisoned. Um, and many of those die, you know, needlessly. They really didn't need to die. And that's why um, the NGOs have tried to train the fishermen in the barrier nets because they actually catch, um, they're more selective and they only catch the fish that they want with those. That was a really good question. Thank you. All right, all Thank great you. questions so far. Good job, yeah. classroom. We're gonna swing back to the beginning. We'll go back to, um, Mrs. DeShane's class and turn her microphone on. Thank you. And we have Nate for with a question. Go ahead, Nate. Hi, what Nate. other places have you been? Oh, um, let's see. So I, as I mentioned, as a photojournalist, I traveled a lot before I did my, my research. So I lived in the Seychelles Islands, which are in the Indian Ocean. 
Um, I lived in Kenya, I've lived in Uganda, and, and visited Rwanda in East Africa. Um, I was actually studying chimpanzees there, which is fun. Um, I've lived in Australia when I was studying abroad there for undergrad. Um, I actually sailed on a sailboat from San Diego to Costa Rica in Central America um, for six months. Uh, and those, those are the main places I've been. Um, so I, I feel really grateful I've had the opportunities to do that. And I, you know, I know um, that's a real privilege that, that I've been able to enjoy that. Thank you. All right, so let's visit Anchorage, Alaska again. Your microphone's on, Mrs. Carton's group. We have a two-part question. The first part is, what is one of the most surprising things that you have learned in the time of you being in your job? And then also the second part of that is, what advice do you have for students who are wanting to be young conservationists? Oh, wow, those are really good questions. Um, okay, so the most surprising part, I think, um, as you could kind of hear maybe in my in my presentation, I first came to do the work I do because I love wildlife and I love marine life and, and nature. Um, but I quickly realized as I engaged with it more and as I was out in, in nature more and in the ocean more that um, people, you know, are a big part of that equation. And um, it's really important to also understand human behavior and, um, you know, what, how we interact with nature um, and how we can help you know, protect it. And so that's something I didn't really think about before I started my work. Um, uh, and now I have a better understanding of and really um, find really interesting. So that's the, that's the answer to your first question as a surprising part of my work. Um, and then for anyone that's interested in getting involved in conservation, there's so many ways you can do it. And it can, you know, it can be something as simple as starting like um, either a river, going through a river cleanup on the weekends and helping clean up trash or, or a beach if you're by an ocean um, to getting more involved um, with your local uh, uh, water to water quality testing. That's another thing you can do um, in, the, in the coastal areas. Uh, but you can also do art and do like music and things that um, that ha relate to the to nature and the environment. There's so many different ways you can get involved in conservation, um, and it it really what you is most important is that you draw on your particular interests and skills and strengths, um, and and reach out to your local community to, to to figure out how to help. We need all the help we can get. <laughs> all right, great yeah. questions and and a great answer. There's. Um, you know, there's no one way to get somewhere. There's lots of different paths you can take, lots of different things you can chase, and so many different ways to be involved in science and exploration and conservation. Um, there is really no right way, so you've got to find what you love. Absolutely. Excellent. All right, Mrs. Lee's class, your microphone is on again. See if I can do a little note Maybe. to see if we can get it. You guys hear me? Oh, Hi, my name is Ahmed. Um, I got a question really quick. Um, has anybody ever got poisoned by the poison you guys put out? Okay, I think I'm having a little trouble hearing you, but I think you said, has anyone been poisoned by the cyanide that the fishermen use? Um, yeah. Yeah. So I actually, that's something that I, I asked the fishermen when I was there. I went and asked them if they, you know, if any of their children had accidentally gotten into this, into the poison before they used it in the ocean or anything like that. Um, and they didn't seem to, to say that that was the case. But the other um, d destructive fishing practice that I mentioned where they use dynamite to fish, that has caused a lot of uh, trauma in different communities where communities have lost, you know, fishermen have lost their arms or their hands from, from the dynamite exploding before they thought it would and things like that. So these are practices that are destructive to the environment, but they are also quite, can be quite bad um, and, and harmful to the people using them. And so it goes to show that they really are, um, you know, there's a strong motivation to keep using those practices because they are, um, they can catch a lot of fish with them, but there needs to be a balance uh, so that they can also stay healthy while they are catching the fish. So it's a really good question. Thank you. All right, let's jump back to our grade sixes in Virginia. Your microphone's on. Um, 
Do you guys have another question, Virginia? Brian. Hi. Um, so my question is, what's it like being a woman working in a career field, career, career field generally populated by men? Ah, that's a really also good question. You guys are full of good questions today. Um, yeah, that's definitely been interesting. And I have found that um, I've been one of few women in many of the things that I've done which, with surfing, um, as a photographer, um, and as uh, now as a scientist, as a researcher. Um, I think it's, it's definitely pre presented more challenges, and I've had to really make sure that I'm... Um, uh, clear about my goals and what I want to achieve um, and just don't let anything sort of discourage me from moving forward bit by bit um, to those goals. Um, but, you know, overall, I definitely I definitely have found the communities I've worked in to be quite supportive. And even if I've had, you know, sort of run ons with um, people not, you know, not being so welcoming to women in the field, there's always a, a larger group that it that has been really welcoming. And so I really tried to be um, uh, really pay attention to who I reach out to and who I make these connections with so that, you know, I build a strong supportive community around me. But that's, it's a really good question. And, you know, for all of us today, women and men, we need to just really find ways to support each other in all of our, in all of our endeavors. <laughs> all right. And one more time to Anaheim with Mrs. Kopp's group. Hello, my name is Michael, and I have a two-part question. Um, first of all, um, what was like the what was your favorite animal you've ever encountered? Ooh, um, oh, that's such a good question. You know, my favorite animal I've ever encountered. There's two. Can I have two? Do any of you guys have one? <laughs> Um, I would do, so there is the giant leatherback turtle that's massive. It's the biggest turtle in the world, and it grows um, up to you know like oh eight maybe not eight feet long. That's an exaggeration, um, but they get really big. Uh, and then the other one is the sunfish, the mola mola sunfish, which um, are really funny looking fish that that swim around on their side and absorb the sun as they go. So those are my two favorite. Mola, mola, I'm a little and for the second question, um, what was the most dangerous um, animal you've encountered? Mm. So oh, that's a good question too. Let's see. So in my field site, there's a there's a sea snake that swims around in the sea, in the ocean, and it's actually the one the one fish that fishermen don't catch. It's the one marine animal they don't catch and, and eat. Um, because it's very, very venomous. Um, and so they're very, they're really scared of the sea snake and I was scared of it too. And I think that's probably, um, yeah, the scariest animal I've encountered. But later I actually learned that their mouth doesn't open big enough to bite, to really get into, onto a human. So it's not actually as scary as I thought originally. <laughs> but they're still interesting to see a snake swimming around in the water. <laughs> Thank, thank you. you for the question. Thank yeah. The question. All right. Well, Shannon, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. That was great. It's always great to, oh, hold on. Um, yeah, we'll stick around at the end for that for sure. So Mrs. Carton's class in Alaska is just asking if they can do a, a selfie with you at the end. And we'll definitely, oh, if you absolutely. can stick around for a minute, we'll do that with them. Sure. Um, yeah, Shannon, thank you so much for hanging out with us today and for um, sharing some of your adventures, sharing some of your story and why these kind of issues are important and definitely for inspiring some of the students to, to get out on their own and find out what's important to them. So absolutely great to have you with us today. Yeah, thank you so much. And I just want to say one thing to everybody. Um, well, I want to thank you for your time and for being with me. And also, I got my start with National Geographic through their grants program. And so if you, um, you, you just, it's something to start thinking about. Anything that interests you in, in the world, you could apply for a grant for it from, from National Geographic. So it's something to check out. You can go on their website and get a sense for the kind of projects they fund. And maybe in a few years, you can start doing your own exploring through National Geographic.
So thank you so much, everybody. All right, so I'm gonna turn the classroom microphones on, give them a chance to be nice and loud, say goodbye and thank you, and then we'll <laughs> sign off for today. So here we go, let me turn on the microphones. It's gonna get loud. Go ahead, boys and girls. Microphones coming on. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us today. We've got some more events coming up tomorrow, so stay tuned. Thanks, everyone.